We've seen the Babalat Slema, uh, the two versions of the Babalat Slema, if you may. One is the corollary of the other, of course. Um, so we want to see how we can use it. So we are going to look at a very simple example. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it, there's this nice aside which says that the discovery of Babalat Slema is what made analysis of adaptive systems possible. Yeah, otherwise for the longest time folks were struggling to figure out how to prove convergence in adaptive control. Yeah, there was no good way because LaSalle invariance doesn't apply. Yeah, so this in fact was sort of a path breaking result or the result was already there and the finding of the result was the path breaking part I guess, alright. Um, so for the application we just look at a simple spring mass damper system, yeah. Uh, you know that the dynamics looks like this, right, for this system and this F is the external force that is being applied. And if I write it in state space form, then it looks like this, okay. X1 is the position, X2 is the velocity, okay, pretty simple. And F is of course the force if you choose to apply it. Okay? Now, uh, now typically in nonlinear control, also in adaptive control, we want the states to follow some tra trajectory, some desired trajectory. Again, uh, I don't think we did any trajectory following examples as such. I don't think we did any trajectory following examples, but it's not very difficult. You will see how, how we do trajectory following. How do we do trajectory following? Suppose I want to follow a trajectory for this spring mass damper system, which is of course a position trajectory and a velocity trajectory, right? Now uh, the velocity trajectory of course has to be the derivative of the position trajectory, right? Because otherwise it's not a compatible trajectory, yeah? position and velocity, right? They have to be the derivative of each other, right? So this is a in fact, in, in control, this is typically called a matching condition. Basically, it says that your trajectories have to be, have to satisfy some conditions. They can't be some ridiculous trajectory. For example, if your dynamical system is second order system and your trajectory is divided, derived from a fourth order system, doesn't make sense. You can't track it, okay. So, so basically, this is like a matching condition. These are called matching conditions. So, the trajectories satisfy this requirement, yeah, okay. Now, once you have this, we define error variables because what we've learned how to go to zero until now. That's what we've been doing, right? All stabilization, everything is going to zero. So we want to construct error variables because we'll drive the errors to zero. Okay. So what is the error? There is a position error, there is a velocity error. The position error is just x1 minus x1 desired. The velocity error is just x2 minus x2 desired. Alright? Done. So and you can see that x2 minus x2 desired is basically x1 dot minus x1 desired dot. Right? This is from the dynamics of the system, right? the spring mass damper. All right. Now, now I'm going to write the dynamics of the error because that's the system I'm going to work with. I will always work with the error system now. So it will be e1 dot and e2 dot is what I'm going to write. So what is e1 dot? e1 dot is x1 dot minus x1 desired dot. But that's exactly the same as this. So that's e2. Make sense? This happened because I had a matching condition. If I did not have a matching condition, this will not happen. Okay? Great. Then I compute E2 dot, which is X2 dot minus X2 desired dot. X2 desired dot is just some function of time. So, it's just I can write it as X1 desired dot double dot. Yeah? And X2 dot comes from the dynamics. And that's what I have substituted here. Okay? So, that's it. This is my uh, dynamics, the error dynamics and I want to drive the errors E1 and E2 to 0, okay, that's the aim. So how do I do it? I can choose a Lyapunov function and all that but it's pretty straightforward. What do I want to do? I, I try to get a nice system to follow, okay. What is the nice system I try to follow in this case? I know that this system Yeah, I know that this is a nice system, right? It's nice, it's a damped oscillator. Yeah, and I know that this will do a good job. So I want to follow this system, right? So I choose my control such that I my right hand side looks like this. Yeah. Okay. So 
what did I do? I did exactly that. I chose, I chose to cancel this, this, this. You can see. And then I introduced the nice terms. All right, simple. That's exactly what I did. All right, great. Of course, K1 and K2 was non-negative. In fact, strictly positive. I don't know why we have to say non-negative. They are actually strictly positive. Yeah, because K1 and K2 are exactly these guys. In fact, they are not restricted to choosing the same K1, K2 here. You could have chosen something else also. Your call. How much control you want to apply. Yeah, that's your call. Yeah, and you can see uh, this control. Uh, I think we discussed this at some point. A lot of control of mechanical systems looks like some feed forward plus feedback. This is exactly that. This is the feed forward part, which is cancelling the dynamics and effect of trajectory. And then there's a feedback, which is like a proportional derivative control, okay. PD control. Okay. If you don't have a feed forward term. And you don't have any idea what your feed forward term is supposed to look like, then you have to have an integral term. Okay. So if you're not doing good, so this is the standard principle by which control folks work. Yeah. Why does integral term work? Because it's some kind of it reduces your steady state error, right? So it's it's like a internal model principle. Basically, that's the idea. It's introducing an internal model. But if you have a very if you already know your feed forward term, which is this, you don't need the integral. This is enough. Okay, integral term is required if you are modeling errors and you don't know what your proper model is, then you need an integral term. Otherwise, you have a feed forward plus a PD. Good enough. Okay, great. So this is the F. So of course, I end up with this dynamics. That's what I wanted to do. Now, what do I want to do? I want to prove stability, right? So now I'm back to this system. Of course, you will say, uh, why should I, you know? Uh, put some great effort into it. I already know that this is a, uh, this is basically, um, you know, a linear system, time invariant system. I'm just going to compute the eigenvalues. I'm done. I'll, I know that I'll get nice negative eigenvalues here. Okay. But suppose this was not a linear system, right? But it was non-linear system. Yeah. And you are, you end up in this situation. You will need to come up with an energy functional and things, a uh, Lyapunov function and all that. So let's do it. Okay. Why not? Yeah. And because more often than not, we will come up with a non-linear system. So what do I do? I take a very standard Lyapunov function. What is this? This is the energy of the system, energy of this guy, right? Because this is the potential energy, this is the kinetic energy, right? Just you know that this is non negative, right? And then I start taking derivatives along this trajectory, just like we've been doing, okay? What happens? First term gives k1 e1 e1 dot, second gives e2 e2 dot, right? Plug in for e1 dot, which is e2, plug in for e2 dot, which is this guy. What do I get? Minus k2 e2 square. This is only negative semi definite, right? Because it contains only one state. Yeah? Nothing can be definite until it contains all the states, right? So, obviously, only negative semi definite. So, from uh, Lyapunov theorem, what do I get at this stage? What can I conclude from Lyapunov theorem? V is, v is nice positive definite radial unbounded and everything and V dot is negative semi definite. What do I conclude from the Lyapunov theorem? Stability, only stability or uniform stability if you want, although it is irrelevant here because there is no time dependent. Uniform stability in the sense of Lyapunov, okay? But that is ridiculous, right? Because I know that this system is asymptotically stable, exponentially stable, yeah? So I want to be able to prove more. Yeah, and you know that you can do this with LaSalle invariance in this case because it's an autonomous system actually. The closed loop system is now an autonomous system. Okay, but we won't. We will use the Babala theorem now. Okay, all right. How do we use it? We do what is called signal chasing analysis. So remember this word. Yeah, and the steps are very standard. Yeah, you have to. It's almost like memorizing. You can memorize these steps. One, two, three. It will always work like that. Yeah, so. Anyway, so this is the claim. Yeah, we've already proved stability, so we only are left to prove convergence, right? Asymptotic stability is just stability plus convergence, right? So we only need to prove this much. Yeah. Okay. How do we do this? Step one. So we know that v is lower bounded because it's greater than or equal to zero, and it is non-increasing because v dot is less than or equal to zero. This means what? By lemma, the first lemma that v infinity exists and is finite. Yeah, 
any signal that is lower bounded and so I am looking at, so notice that here until this point I was looking at V as a function of the states and so on, but you may, here I transition to writing V as a function of time, okay. So I have implicitly assumed that I have solved the system and plugged in the solutions, therefore it is a function of time, okay. But remember also this is big caveat when you are using Babelert's lemma, yeah, um, this is not a uniform result. Why? Because you fixed an initial condition, okay. You did not take arbitrary, this results do not hold valid for any initial condition. It is for that particular initial condition you chose. But then you can choose another initial condition and do the same analysis, okay. So that is one of the issues that is a point of contention when folks use Babelert's lemma, but that is not a big deal for us right now, okay. So anyway, V is lower bounded, non-increasing. Why the first lemma we saw today, V infinity exists and is finite, okay, great. Second step, both E1 and E2 are bounded, how? V is quadratic in E1 and E2, right. So, V is not, V is not increasing, so therefore, V is less than V equal to V0, right. Therefore, V itself is bounded. If V is bounded, V is quadratic in E1 and E2, nothing can cancel each other, right. E1 square, K1 E1 square plus E2 squared, so they can't cancel each other. Therefore, both E1 and E2 have to be bounded. If either one of them is unbounded, V is unbounded, okay, no choice, okay. Therefore, E1, E2 are bounded and boundedness is identical to L infinity. You already said boundedness and L infinity are exactly the same things, alright, great. Step 3, E2 belongs to L2. How do I do that? Whatever appears in the V dot, huh, I integrate both sides of this equation from 0 to infinity, okay, integrate 0, infinity, 0, infinity, both sides, okay. What do I get? This, okay. Now, I know that the left hand side is integrable, right, why? Because the left hand side is just dv by dt times dt, right, so dt dt goes away, so it is just integral of dv. So basically it is v at infinity minus v at 0. But I already proved that V at infinity is finite, right. So from step 1, this is basic, the left hand side is just V infinity minus V of 0, okay, clear, clear, okay, simple step. And the right hand side is as it is, I have not touched it, okay. So what do I know? And this, what does this look like? What is this? 2 norm, it is the square of the 2 norm, 2 signal norm. Okay, so that's what I've written here. I can actually solve this to get the two signal norm as this guy. I'm sorry, what? Ah, okay, yeah. Two signal norm is this. Two signal norm is just the definition. So I get this equality. From here, it's obvious that e2 this is bounded, right? Because this is, in fact, I can solve this. This is v0 minus v infinity divided by k2, right? From here, right? And therefore, e2 is l2, right? How do you say a signal is in L2 if its L2 norm is bounded? So it is, okay, great. Step 4, E2 dot is also bounded, okay. What is E2 dot? This already proved E1 and E2 are bounded, K1 and K2 are constants, so obviously this is bounded. So E2 dot is bounded, okay. I can now use the Babalat's lemma, the corollary. Why? On the signal E2, E2 is L infinity and L2 and E2 dot is L infinity. So therefore, by the corollary to the Babalat's lemma, I have proved that E2 goes to 0, okay, okay. So whatever appeared in the V dot, the first set of steps is proving that whatever appears in the V dot, that goes to 0, okay. So we have done that, alright, great. Now. So we have done that, E2 goes to 0. Now we want to prove that E1 goes to 0. How do we do that? We start by proving that the derivatives of E2 go to 0, okay. So let us do that. 
next steps okay so uh, so i will say actually until here proved whatever appears in v dot goes to zero all right now in order to prove that the rest of the variables or rest of the states go to zero i will start by proving the derivatives of all these quantities go to zero so i want to prove e2 dot goes to zero okay how do i do that i will apply the original bavelet's lemma how i will start by claiming that e2 dot is integrable so what is the integral of e2 dot this guy but i know that e2 infinity is already zero i just proved it because this is just e2 infinity minus e2 at zero right again with a poor notation don't worry about there is no such thing as e2 infinity this is actually limit as t goes to infinity e2 okay but i have proved that it is zero yeah i'm just using an abuse of notation okay so this is zero and this is minus e2 zero so this is minus e2 zero which is a finite quantity right obviously you started with the finite value of the initial state you could not have started with an infinite value again wouldn't make sense so therefore e2 dot is integrable okay we satisfied the first requirement of the bavelet lemma what was the second requirement that the signal be uniformly continuous all right so integrable and uniform continuity how do i prove it's uniformly continuous take the second derivative right so derivative of this should be bounded okay so i'm just taking the derivative of this i'm taking the derivative of this guy now right and that's what k1 e1 dot k2 e2 dot i again plug in for e1 and e2 but i know again that e1 e2 are bounded and everything else is constant so therefore e2 double dot is also bounded okay so if e2 double dot is bounded means e2 dot is uniformly continuous means e2 dot is going to zero okay now we are pretty much done look at what is e2 dot i have proved that e2 dot on the left goes to zero as t goes to infinity on the right i have proved that e2 goes to zero as t goes to infinity so if i take limits on both sides the only way the equality can hold in the limit is if e1 goes to zero as t goes to infinity okay if you take limit as t goes to infinity for this limit to hold this guy is already going to zero this is already going to zero so i'm left with the requirement that even has to go to zero as t goes to infinity okay so that's what you see in the next page right that e1 goes to zero as t goes to infinity because nothing else is possible okay so this is it if you see the logic is a little bit similar to the lasalle invariance only use because if you went with lasalle invariance you will first look at the set where v dot is zero which is the set of all states e1 e2 such that e2 is zero and then you will look at the largest invariant set inside e2 equal to zero for that you will say that e2 dot is zero and if e2 dot is zero you know that e1 has to be zero so similar logic actually but the way we do it is slightly different okay here you use notions of integrability or being in an lp L infinity space and uh, uniform continuity okay actually this is easier to implement all the steps look longer yeah it seems like we took more time through this but this is easier to implement uh, than the lasalle invariance many people get confused with lasalle invariance but they don't with this yeah you just have to do these exact 8 9 steps yeah the steps are exactly like that the first set of steps is to prove that whatever appeared in the v dot is going to go to zero after that you just prove that the derivative of whatever appeared in v dot goes to zero and once you prove that derivative of whatever appeared in v dot goes to zero you have that you know you will end up proving that the other states also go to zero you should you should if you can't then you can't then you cannot do much more anyway so like i said you could have used the lasalle invariance but of course bavelet lemma uh, not lasalle invariance but krasovsky babashin krasovsky lasalle theorem uh, but the bavelet's lemma can be used in a wider context for example this setting if the coefficients are now functions of time okay suppose for some reason you have functions of time as coefficients here okay 
whatever you want to get some fun performance in different domains and whatever go faster in some domain and slower faster initially slower later or something like that yeah then how do you prove then you can't even use eigen values and all that now you can't now it's no longer in a time invariant system it's a time varying system so eigen values don't work anymore yeah so simple results simple ideas will not work so the question is can you use bavlet's lemma still to prove actually you can you just have to make some additional assumptions okay so of course i have given a nice hint which says i mean first obvious assumption is that these two have to be strictly positive for all time okay so that is the first assumption otherwise you can't even construct a proper lyapunov function okay but the idea is this for these sort of systems lasalle invariance also will not work you can't because i am not saying anything about this periodicity or anything this is not constant not necessarily periodic so lasalle invariance and babashin krasovsky lasalle also doesn't apply but barblet's lemma has no issue no distinction between this and the time invariant case yeah if you can still prove that the signal is l infinity l2 and derivative is l infinity you will still have the same result okay so this is an exercise that uh, i would sort of like you folks to try and see how you can use the babelats lemma okay so this is sort of how you use the babelats lemma like i said standard steps yeah basis is this two three lemmas right the lower boundedness lemma that is lower bounded and non increasing then you have an limit as t goes to infinity this is the one the other one is that f dot is bounded implies that the signal is uniformly continuous and then the babelats lemma so these three results are what i used to do this signal chasing analysis okay